Hey everyone, happy February. Hard to believe wow. February is right on us. I feel like we're already into spring, but I'm like, let, let March from spring break happen. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be here soon. I know, Kath and Beth, I'm so excited. We've got the Brits joining us today. So we'll introduce formally Nina and Lauren and Kat in a few minutes, but we're so excited that you're here. What time is it for you guys right now back home? Uh, it is 5 p.m. So. 5 p.m., all right. I think downtime. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, thank you for, you know, I guess some people are having lunch with us. Some people are having dinner with us. You know, it's it's a meal. It's a, we're, we're meeting around a meal, I guess, is sort of the theme of today. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. We're just so happy to see you. Oh, thank you so much for having us on. Honestly, it's so lovely to see your faces again. And it's so kind of you to invite us. Well, it's been I about, what, six months since we've seen each other in person. I, yeah, it was June. Too long. Too yeah. long. We had the best trip. We were in Finland mm -hmm. for the LM mid Midnight Sun KOL event. And that was like a dream come true. It was just such an amazing trip. So we we're so thrilled to meet with you three. And we instantly connected after that first dinner. It was like, I think we were all like glue for the rest of the trip. <laughs> it was such a great time. I would love to know the people that are watching right now, if you're at home, tell us where you're watching from. I think we're going to have a potentially a few people from outside of Canada and maybe outside of the U.S. that are joining us today. So in the ah. chat, let us know kind of where you where you're joining us from. We'd love to uh, to see how uh, how far we've reached today. That'd be pretty awesome. Ontario, British Columbia, Winnipeg, Montreal. Awesome. All of these places sound very exotic to us. <laughs> <laughs> I think we might have to visit. What do you think, girls? Yes. Yeah. We would love that. ASAP. Yeah, that'll be our next event that we plan. Get you through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. We're All having right. Dr. Joy. Dr. Joy's coming on with us. Um, well, she's coming live on April Six and seventh, we're doing a, a one day workshop. It's an instrumentation workshop. So she's she's coming to RDHU. So we're excited about that. That's going to be amazing. She She's obviously, you know, so knowledgeable with her instrumentation. So I'm going to have to put that one in myself. <laughs> yes, I think so. It's a better weather to come join us at that time. Okay. There's I know. No, in April, we'll be, we'll probably have a hot flash as we usually do around that sort of ODA, Ontario Dental Association time. It's like, wait a minute, everything gets super hot and warm. So, um, but yeah, no, we would, we would love to meet you guys in person. Oh, this is so nice. We've got it's quite a variety of people that have joined today. So Beth, why don't you do the formal introduction for, for our lovely guests today and tell us a little bit about them. I would love to. So I have a big honor today of introducing our guests. Um, you are going to be in for a treat today. I'm so excited about the discussion we're going to be having. Um, we honestly need probably 10 hours to go through the knowledge that and the insight into the dental hygiene profession that is here today is just out of this world. So I'm thrilled. But again, I do wish we had much more time. So I'm going to introduce our guests and then we're going to get right into the program. So I'm going to start with Kat. Kat Edney is a multi-award winning dental therapist. Kat Edney qualified from the prestigious King's College University in London and has over 15 years experience working in specialist and private practice. In this time, she has developed a passion for multidisciplinary team working in the dental setting with a focus on maximizing the use of the full dental team to ensure comprehensive care alongside patient experience and engagement. With a passion for digital dentistry and incorporating education into consultations, Kat lectures nationally as a clinical educator and speaker and has developed hands-on dental courses under her training brand, The Modern Therapist, which aims to educate the dental profession about the role and integration of dental therapy, alongside focusing on providing gold standard hands on training and ongoing support to dental teams. So welcome, Kat. We are thrilled to have you here. Next, we have Nina, Nina Farmer. Nina has been working in dentistry for over 20 years, so she started when she was five. Nina started her career as a dental nurse and then went on to study dental hygiene and dental therapy at Sheffield Dental School and graduated in 2013. 
Nina is passionate about well-being and taking a more holistic approach in the treatment of her patients. So Nina graduated as a nutritional therapist in 2019. Nina works in a mixed NHS and private dental practice and works to her full scope of practice, incorporating nutrition into her daily conversations and treatments with her patients. Nina also works as a nutritional therapist online, helping clients with their health and well-being. Nina is a clinical educator and has provided lectures, workshops, webinars, and articles to empower other dental professionals to feel confident with using nutrition in their daily practice and to use this information for their own health and well-being. Welcome, Nina. And then last but not least, we have the lovely Lauren Long. Lauren Long is a dental therapist with over 15 years experience working exclusively in private practice in Edinburgh. She is a clinical educator, lecturer, and KOL for several leading dental companies, as well as writing regular articles for, for professional publications. Lauren was awarded Dental Therapist of the Year at the Dental Awards 2022, as well as Best Therapist at the Dentist Scotland Awards 2022. Alongside her clinical work, Lauren currently holds the position of Therapist Clinical Director for Pain-Free Dentistry Group, allowing her to explore her passion of supporting other dental therapists and hygienists to achieve the best possible working environment whilst utilizing their entire skill set to create a career they love. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you. Wow. Well, it's lovely to have you all here. And um, as I mentioned earlier, we just have a million questions that we could ask. So I think I'm going to just start off by asking, uh, what are the different career paths available in the UK? I know that there are dental hygienists or dental therapists, and those words were mentioned quite often in the bios we just read. Um, I'm just wondering how these differ. Um, well, I think I'll start um, because actually when I went to train as a dental hygienist and dental therapist at that time, they were considered two separate qualifications. Um, a dental hygienist is very much prevention, um, or, um, cleaning um, and periodontal care and maintenance, periodontal treatment, whereas a dental therapist adds to that scope of practice to also do restor restorative care. So a dental therapist will, in addition to what a dental hygienist can do, we can also cut cavities, we can diagnose decay, um, and we can fill cavities as well, restore teeth. We also do a lot of pediatric care. So as a dental therapist, you can extract pediatric teeth um, and you can place crowns on pediatric teeth as well. So that's sort of the preformed um, metal crowns that you can get. Um, so when I qualified, I actually did two qualifications alongside each other, a dental hygiene qualification and a dental therapy qualification. But nowadays in the UK, it's actually really rare to be able to do just a hygiene qualification. There's actually only one or two universities that do that. Um, and so generally it's all rolled into one qualification, which I think that's the one you have, is it not Lauren? Yes, as and actually myself and Kat um, both qualified in the same year, which just shows you how much it varies across the UK as well. So um, I did a combined degree, degree course, and um, which was called Oral Health Sciences, which basically was the hygiene and the therapy qualification all rolled into one, as Kat says. And I think we learned fairly similar things. Am I right in saying, Kat? It was pretty similar. I think it's quite, it was quite varied. I mean, this is the thing, um, even in the UK now, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding around what the roles of hygienist and therapist entail. And that's something that all three of us are really passionate about improving the understanding in the UK of how are we used, how are therapists utilized. And um, certainly um, Lauren and I are banging the drum about restorative care a lot. And um, Nina, obviously, about um, being able to diversify our, our profession as well so um, but yeah it's it's interesting because the career paths are different because I didn't start as a dental nurse I just went straight from my A-levels um, which is sort of like your finals in senior school um, I went straight from there and got into university not knowing anything about dentistry but actually um I think it's different from a lot of other hygienists and therapists I think like um, Nina you started as a dental nurse didn't you 
I did. I started as a dental nurse, as I say, when I was five years old. Yeah. Um, and I, um, and the moment that I joined that dental practice, I was like, I want my own patients. I knew from like that first week, but my dentist was like, you know, calm down, <laughs> you know, learn the job first. And and I did do that for about 10 years. Um, and then I, when I went to dental school, I actually found that Sheffield, where I studied, that they split the year in half. So half of us had a dental nurse background and half of us had the more academic um having a degree background and we all helped each other so you know we would be very comfortable in the surgery sort of setting and we have to set it all up and then when it came to becoming you know doing all these presentations we had some help with our assignments as well with everyone who'd had this sort of like academic route as well so I think it was really valuable um I think it's still quite common but it's not necessarily a, a pre prerequisite for, for doing the um qualification I don't think you were a dental nurse before were you Lauren? No, no, I wasn't a dental nurse before either. I was similar to Kat. I came straight from school, just having done exams. Um, and I had a few, um, it was quite mixed in my um, class at university as well. So we had a few people who had been dental nurses um, and actually they knew much more of what they were in for than us who had just come from school and had yeah. barely set foot in a dental practice apart from being a patient, you know. So I think there are advantages to both, as you say, you know, sometimes um, as a dental nurse, you kind of, you knew, you knew what you were getting into and you knew some of the things already maybe. It's like yes. us going through dental assisting yeah. before going into hygiene. Back in the day, that was what we had to do. So I was a dental assistant before I became a dental hygienist. How long is your program? So like it's three years, I believe, still. Mm -hmm. But if you do purely dental hygiene, that's two years. And there, I think I believe there's two universities that do purely just dental hygiene. Um, and then they offer for you to top up by a year. Um, which I think it's great because as we say, as we're saying, a lot of dental hygienists come in when they're a bit more mature, they've been doing dental nursing already or assisting already. And so it's quite a commitment to then go back to school for three years and have to pay fees for three years. So I quite like that there's the two options there um, and being able to top up. But equally, I do believe that you know, we once you're able to do dental hygiene, that you have the manual dexterity and the skill of being able to um, look after patients, actually restorative isn't that much different. It's, it's maybe a little scarier. Um, but other than that, I think it's, you know, a, a dental hygienist should be able to to transfer skills into doing restorative very easily. So I, I, I really like the idea of the top up year. So what are the routes that you can take to become either a dental hygienist or a dental therapist in the UK? I know in Ontario and across Canada, there's different routes and opportunities. Can you expand it? Because I think some people that are watching are like, wait a minute, I love Ontario, but what if I wanted to move to the UK? What might I need? Like, what would some of the qualifications? And I know you've got to look, um, you know, in each that each area, but if you were just to sort of enter into it, what would that route look like? Well, yeah, if you start, sorry, there are, Canadian, sorry Nina. there are actually some Canadian hygienists that I know of who work in the UK and yeah. actually what they've had to do is convert their qualification from Canada, demonstrate to our registration board that um, what they have learned in Canada is the same as we require in the UK. So it is actually possible for people to register um, from, from overseas um, it, at the moment, it takes a long time. We've got a big backlog um, of that. Um, but in terms of other routes within the UK, Nina, I think you were about to jump in and say. Oh, well, I was just going to say with regards to from the dental nursing perspective, there's a, there's post qualifications you can take after you have your dental nursing qualification. And I did radiography and oral health educators. Um and I did uh, an A level in human biology. And I remember being so desperate to do it that I did it all at the same time. So I would <laughs> I had five years of, of driving up and down the country and studying and revising. But I knew that when I applied for it, I proven that I really wanted it. So it, it did give me a good, strong application. But there are, as I say, there is, I was just sort of wanting to highlight that you can go down the more academic route or that there are these sort of post qualifications that you can collect, which I think are are really great because they can really apply them to the job straight away as well I'll um, always be grateful for um, the fact I had my radiography because I got Fridays and Mondays off when I was at dental school as well whilst <laughs> everybody else learnt it <laughs> <laughs> so I understand the we've kind of been talking about the formal road of education but as far as diversifying your skill set 
Um, I know that the three of you here have very different um, paths that you've taken. So can you talk to me a little bit about diversifying your skill set and what that's looked like for all three of you? Nina? <laughs> well, I suppose, I suppose with me having my, yeah, my, <laughs> my dual train as a nutritional therapist is probably quite a big one there. Um, I've always been really passionate about the whole body approach and the holistic approach. And I, but I, I'm also very mindful that in, in the job that we do, we need to be evidence based and we need to be safe, don't we? And not sort of giving sort of unsafe advice. So I decided that I would go back and study and to qualified in 2019. And um, yeah, I'm able now to bring that little bit more to my, my hygiene appointments, my dental therapy appointments. Patients come to you because they love to talk about themselves, don't they? And I don't mean that in a, in a negative way. I mean, they're there to talk about themselves. And if you spot something and talk about it, they feel very cared for and like you're looking that little bit deeper. So I found that with having worked at my the practice that I work at for 10 years, I've developed a really good relationship with my patients and and I'd be able to see change in them over time and I've been able to go a little bit deeper with that um I can't always do nutritional quality and um, like consultations because we know a dental practice is obviously we need, need to keep running but you know they do have then access to me to work as a one-to-one -one as well so that's what I've been doing with my um my dual qualification not to put you on the spot Nina but I know um, a lot of us in dental hygiene, we have the basic understanding of nutrition, but you've really taken it further than anything I have seen. And just really looking for clues intraorally that lead to nutritional deficiencies and things like that. Is there anything, maybe a case or something that you would be able to share with us? Just a little bit of insight into what it looks like for you in practice. Yeah, I've got some slides if you'd like me to share that with some pictures. I would love it. Yes, okay. thank you. You beat me to the question, Beth. I was just going to ask, and I'm like, I'm like, so can you give us some things to look for? Please oh. help me. So you totally were on it. Thank you, Nina. <laughs> no, you're welcome. I know we all like to look at tongs and things like that, don't we? You know, that's why we're all doing this job. Um, so I'm just going to share now. You should put that in the job description and in, in the description of the course when you're going to dentistry. So just so you know, you're going to think it's fun now to look at these things on a regular basis as you eat your lunch and as you eat your other stuff. This is just this is just our normal life, right? Yeah. <laughs> So I really, I just put a few slides together because I just wanted to show you some of the things that I would look at um, when I am looking at my my patients. And obviously tongs is a big one. Um, mm -hmm. So I, when I'm looking at people's tongs, I'm looking at B vitamin. So B vitamin is the energy and stress vitamin. So the first thing that I look at, think about my patients when I think that they're depleted in some B vitamins, which is usually a manifestation of cracked mouth cracked tongue um these patients they're stressed so th that helps me to have a bit more of an insight on how I want to sort of interact with them and my you know how I can then I can then look at them as a person this person's very stressed they or maybe perhaps they've got some digestive issues because they um all the B vitamins are digested or synthesized in the gut and if that's the case we're going to have some sort of issues further down the line with well-being because they're not absorbing everything so you may be familiar with some of these things we've got a, on the far left here we've got a red tip tongue and um, that can be a deficiency of sort of B9 B12 and um, down here we've got more of the glossitis um Again, that can be linked to B12. And then we've got the, the geographic tongue. I thought that was a nice sort of swirly one for you all. Um, but again, that can be B9 and B12 as well. But the one in the middle is the one that got me really, I really get excited to tell you about because I had this patient and she was um, treating, she was caring for her husband. And she, you can see the remnants of the angular colitis in the corner of her mouth. They've dried up now because this was sort of after it sort of happened, but she had it for about seven years and she had tried every sort of antifungal um, barrier cream um, and she was really, really sore in the corners of her mouth. And she came to see me one day and we thought, should we try some B vitamins? Um, and she came back a week later and it had gone after having it sort of for seven years and she was very, very uncomfortable. So for me, that was a real win. Um, and that's why I wanted to show you this picture today, because to me, that was something that I feel very passionate about as well. And you can imagine then every time I come in, she's like, look, you know, and she's showing me. And if she ever gets a bit more stressed, you know, she's straight back on the B vitamins because we knew B vitamins aren't forever. It was just giving her that little bit of additional support during that time. Um, so that's one that I always get really excited about. She actually knows that she's famous now. So I always talk about her whenever I um, present. Um, this was another one that I was that I wanted to sort of highlight that I don't just look at um the head and the mouth I look at people's nails as well this patient actually walks into my surgery now with his thumbs together ready for his photograph because he's so used to me sort of looking after him but um 
for years and years, I kept saying, I'm sure there's something not right with your nails. Um, they don't look right to me. And he was saying that they were a little bit damaged from a shutter, perhaps, or um, he just wasn't sure. And you can see what the nails look like. They look very club. So when you put your nails together, they should look like a diamond in between. And you're not going to do it now. So it's a little yeah. diamond shape, and that's called the window of Schwann's. And that's how a healthy nail bed should look. If we've got sort of clubbing, that can be a sign of vitamin D deficiency. So after several attempts of getting my patient to, to sort of get some support with the, the GP, um, we eventually got to the fact that his vitamin D was so unbelievably low that um, he had to go on some very, very high dose vitamin D straight away. And if you think about the role that vitamin D has in inflammation and immunity, you know, it, it does have a very big sort of roundabout effect on their sort of oral health and well-being as well. He came into me and he actually said, I didn't actually realise how tired I was until I got supplemented and, and sorted. Um, so that it, it also transpires. He'd had history of um, skin cancer as well, and he'd been hiding from the sun. So we had this sort of real bonding moment after this and we're now we're now we're like this now me and John um but he he comes in and every winter he says to me what his levels are he gets his fingers out ready for a photo and you know that's really impacted him so this is the kind of thing that gets me really excited and I've just got one more slide I don't know if you can see that one at the top there actually but um these are a few different things that I look for in patients as well you're probably thinking what are they <laughs> um at the top left but they that's that's actually somebody's armpit but we wouldn't necessarily look in somebody's armpit when we're, we're seeing them but you never know when they're in the summer but you can tend to find around the neck or around the sort of chest area that people can have skin tags now we all know that periodontal disease is very much linked with um, diabetes and we have these conversations with our patients the you know the evidence is strong there but it's not always easy to have these conversations and you know often the, the sort of telltale signs of someone who's got visceral fat or you know and um, they might be carrying a bit more weight than they want to and it's not really going to want to point that out of their hygiene appointment to them so it's nice having these other little things that we can look at as well so if you look at the skin tags if they've got skin tags and they say oh actually yeah i've had a few new ones this year or they've got these sort of darker patches here on the elbows at the bottom that can be a sign of cell proliferation so that's too much blood sugar and then the the extra tissue is made as well so these are really two good really things to look out for when you're looking for your periodontal patients can i share a story about the skin tags yeah. so i was doing my head and neck examination on a patient just last week and i said to her i'm like i'm doing it i'm like oh wow you i noticed you've got some skin tags and i know she's been fighting with her weight and i said you know I'm not sure are you aware, but there's a connection sometimes because you didn't have them a few years ago. Now they're developing. And she said, Carrie, you said that last time. And I went to my doctor and I'm borderline. They're watching me for diabetes. And I was like, oh, yes, like, I talked to her last time. And it, she's like, you, you were on it. And she's like, you were on it again, because as you're feeling them with the gloves, you can feel them. I'm like, wait a minute, what's going on? And we had this conversation and you're right. We're not able to diagnose, but we can start that, that awareness. And as you said, if it's not there and then it's there now, there's a change. It's not within normal limits. There is a change in just a, a, a making the patient aware. And you're right. I don't try to look at their underarms. I just look at their neck. Okay. I'm not like, Hey, yeah. show me your underarms, show me all sorts of things, but I am going to be asking about nails now. So thank you. I just thought no, I would you're welcome. share it's that. More com comfortable to have conversations about a skin tag, isn't it? More than saying to someone, Oh, you know, you look like you've put some weight on or you know it's it's not what people go to the hygiene for so it's just opening up these conversations so that's really nice to hear that it's uh it's worked for you as well mm -hmm. um so a couple of the other things that i've got on here are ulcers and um, can be zinc deficiency but again as we know ulcers have many reasons why they might um appear so it's about having that sort of i call it an inner detective about three different things that might suggest to somebody that that they might be having that deficiency. So for example, zinc is affected with taste and sense of smell. And also if they've got lots of white specks on their nails, and um, that can be an indication as well. But you know, as a as as we would be as a dental therapist or a dental hygienist, a dental nutritionist works in the same so a net, sorry, nutritionist works in the same way. We look at the big picture. We don't just look at one thing and say that's it. We we look at the big picture of the patient. Um I just wanted to show you the the tongue at the bottom as well because that's not one of my patients, but I had a patient, a couple of patients, it's, it's happened twice actually, where they've come in and they've had very, very pale tissues and it's transpired that they've had um, an iron deficiency. And both of these people have said to me, oh, because you've sent me to the, the GP and I actually am low in everything, I've had to admit to myself, I've got um, an eating disorder. So thank you for mentioning that. And I've now had this conversation and I've been able to, um, you know, address it. So that was something that was really heart led for me and really, you know, filled that passion because that's it's life changing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, 
at the top there, you've got a little bit of a blood blister on the floor of the, the mouth. Again, that can be vitamin C. It could also be a trauma. Um, but if not many people know, but people who smoke need about 30 milligrams more vitamin C a day. So if you've got a, maybe a patient who smokes and they, they, they aren't getting lots of fruit and veg and you see that in the floor of their mouth, then it's probably worth having a chat with them about some vitamin C as well. So I just wanted to put that on there for that. It's just because of that antioxidant activity, it just churns all that vitamin C up and they use it. So they need a bit more. And then I don't know if you can see, but on the top here, I might need to move that out of the way. You can just see that it's a sort of a, the male um, hair balding pattern on ladies as well. That linked with pale tissues can be a, a sign of low iron as well. Again, I've never actually told somebody or your hair looks like it's thinning, but I've looked then at their tissues and asked them if they're tired and they've gone, you know, down that route by asking them some more questions as well. So it's kind of helped me to have that sort of investigation. So that's just a real whistle stop tour. This is a webinar in itself, to be honest. I could talk about it all day, but I just wanted to share a few of these things with you and see if that was something that you would be interested in. So I'm going to now. What's stop the there. elbow? What's the, the elbow? elbow? Yeah. Sorry. So that's, so I know that the elbow is, um, so it's something called acanthosis nigricans. So, it's when you get these sort of darker patches um, on your elbow. You can see it in the creases of people's necks sometimes. Mm -hmm. Again, armpits. I don't know why I'm talking about armpits so much tonight, but in the summer, you see these things. Um, and that, again, it's the cell proliferation. So, you know how we were saying that the skin tags are made because the, the body's making extra tissue because it doesn't know what to do with all this blood sugar. Um, it's the same. It can manifest in that way as well. So these dark sort of patches and the creases. Or linked to diabetes. Yes. Type, wow. two, type 2 diabetes yeah thank you you're welcome thanks so much nina we did have one question um when you were talking about the the pale tongue did you say that that there was a, a potential deficiency and someone was just yeah. asking for clarification on what that deficiency yeah, iron. is that can be really iron. pale tissue so it can also be on the inside of the the eyelid as well very very pale um and that can be a sign of, of iron deficiency Amazing. I did yeah. warn everyone at the beginning that there was going to be so much knowledge here and that we needed 10 hours. So <laughs> no. we are definitely going to investigate this further with you because I would love to dive deeper into this topic. So we'll be after you, Nina, for something in the future, yeah. for sure. For <laughs> Nina is going to be, Nina's going to be on the dental hygiene quarterly this year. So I'm looking forward to that. I've got yes. lots and lots of pictures. Perfect. So just stop. Yeah. So I know that for um, both Lauren and Kat, you also have diversified in kind of similar ways. You and you, Lauren and Kat both have a kind of a similar path, but differences again. So Kat, could you speak to some of the ways that you have diversified? Yeah, sure. Um, well, actually, I I now currently only work clinically two days a week. Um, and that is because I've really focused a lot on education um, within the UK. I've got a real passion for educating the dental team on what a therapist can do um, and, and what a therapist is and how we can be utilized. And part of that is um, I educate for um, a number of different, I educate for my own training brand, The Modern Therapist. And, and with that, I, I go into practices and I, I um create protocols so mm -hmm. a, a way of working as a therapist um, or with a therapist to create like a shared care and actually this won't sound unusual to the Canadian Canadian listeners because I think it's very similar to what you do whereby you may see the patient first and take all of the information about the patient and then the doctor would pop in um and finish the exam right and in the uk we've never really been able to have that situation um uh or anything that we've been doing it's always been that the dentist would see the patient would treatment plan the patient and then would just send the patient to the hygienist for whatever scale and polish usually um and it was really limiting and restrictive for hygienists and therapists in the uk um because as I said before, the majority of us are therapists now um, and doctors and dentists were still not referring any restorative work to us at all. And what I felt was I could really demonstrate that it's possible for us to see the patient, to examine, examine the patient, to treatment plan for the patient and to communicate um, with not only the patient, but the rest of the team and sort of almost be the center of preventative care for our patients as well. 
And I do a lot of that through digital. So um, a lot of the teaching I do, I'm, I'm, I'm um, doing a lot of lecturing this year for Align who um, have the iTero scanner. Um, and I use the iTero scanner in a way to not just educate my patients because I think a lot of people just use the scanners for Invisalign, um, but actually it's a huge tool for education. But I also use it to communicate with the rest of the team about what care I believe is right for the patient and also what care the patient wants as well. Perfect. I know, and I, I've had the opportunity to speak to you about this off, off camera. So I know how much you utilize it in your practice. Do you also have something maybe, I just want to get to know how you use that in your practice. Do you have anything that you could share with us to kind of show how that is brought to life in your practice? Yeah, I can definitely give you, um, a whistle stop tour. <laughs> okay. Um, a couple of things. If you, if you give me a chance to, I'll just share my screen as well. Um, <laughs> and Kat is going to be on the dental hygiene quarterly this year as well. I'm sensing a theme. Am I right? <laughs> There's a slight theme it's, uh, here coming. It's the LM Dental Midnight Sun KOL theme this year. Mm -hmm. Excited. Wow. Sorry, I'm being useless with this. Oh. <laughs> it's all right. We're putting you on the spot. Oh, it's all up. good. Oh, dear. I've just put all my all my buttons Girl. on the pieces. <laughs> there like we go. Wonder Woman. Are you able to see the screen? Yes. Okay, cool. So um, so as as I was saying before, usually in the UK, the dentist would see the patient and then they would refer that patient to us and they would we'd restrict it, be very restrictive, often missing the fact that the patient has perio and often, you know, taking all the fun stuff to do for themselves and not really giving us a chance to do the restorative stuff that we we, we love and we enjoy. Um, so this, this sort of, um, this infographic that I created was about putting the hygienist or the therapist in the center of prevention and doing the exam yourself and then referring out to the right dentist for the patient at the right time. And I use the iTero scan it, um, to, to facilitate that. So this is something I call the digital examination. So it is actually scanning while speaking to the patient. So a lot of the time when we talk about using an iTero scanner, people ask me, how quickly can I scan my patients? How quick can I be? And I always say, actually, for me, the most important thing is how slow I can be, because I will scan a patient and call out to my assistant behind me exactly what I can see, but in, in real, real simplified layman's terms. So instead of saying lower left, seven or I don't know how you guys notate your teeth but we would say lower left seven um occlusal amalgam or occlusal composite I would say the second molar on your bottom left here has a silver filling in it on the biting surface and my nurse or my assistant would translate that into dental speak on the notes but for the patient I'm really educating them at the same time as them visually seeing what's going on in their mouth and what I found by doing this is that it opens up so many questions. Um, as soon as I finish that scanning, actually in this video, you can see my patient actually reaches up straight away and starts touching the scanner and asking questions. And it's so intuitive because, you know, we all have touch screens these days. Um, so I love using this digital examination tool and essentially educating the patient as I do an exam. And what's really nice about being able to, to allow them that education, that visualization is, once they sit up after I've done that scanner, that scan, we can use all these different tools that the scanner has to, to sort of really deep dive into what's going on in their oral health. And I always say to my patients, you know, as a, as a clinician, I'm, I'm not here to do quick fix. We're not here to do single tooth dentistry. We're not here to do a quick polish of your teeth. We're not here to sort of massage your molars because you've come in for your six monthly hygiene. Um, it's prevention. It's about whole life care and making sure that the teeth you have today are the teeth that you have or better for the rest of your life. Um, so this is actually using the um, Align Oral Health Suite, which is a new development on the scanner. Um, and this is a lovely patient that came in saying, I just, I just have a broken tooth. I need you to just fix this broken tooth. Um, it feels a bit chipped on the inside of my mouth. And um, these are the shots of, of her mouth when she first attended. And um, I was saying, you know, 
what I can see is that it's a bit crowded. Yes, you you know, you know, also have a, a sort, of, sort of like slightly darker tooth on the front. You do have a broken tooth, but I'm noticing some sensitivity, some bleeding, some inflammation. And so actually we use, this is the, um, the Align Oral Health Suite, which is in this new development. We use the Align Oral Health, Oral Health Suite to educate the patient a little bit better about their mouth and, and about what her mouth looks like. So I'm, I'm whistle stop touring through this, these slides for you. So um, you can essentially see um, on this scan, there is inflammation, there is um, calculus buildup, there's recession. And actually she also um, does have a broken tooth, but it's actually a huge fracture on the lingual surface of that um, first molar there. And it wasn't gonna be just a quick fix. Um, even more importantly, rather than just showing her that, I could show her that the reason why it broke was that her occlusion was incorrect. And so she was having this really heavy occlusion just on those molars that had the huge amalgams in. And so, yeah, I could fix this one tooth, but the next tooth on the other side was also probably gonna fracture as well. And true to form, um, when we did do her restorative care, um, where I, what I do with with the scanner, I tend to sort of snapshot. You can snapshot on the scanner, and you can write the, the little bits and tidbits that you want to treatment plan for your patient, and you can sort of um, consent your patient this way. So these things all get sent to the patient, but they also get sent to the, the doctors um, in a report like this. But yes, when we when we did the restorative, the teeth that we said may fracture did fracture. Um, <laughs> so um, so of course we had to, you can see the one on the bottom um, left there, um, just down here, you know, this is the one I had said on the scan, may fracture, may need indirect. Thankfully, because we had that scan, we understood the occlusion, the patient had been informed when it did fracture and we had this huge um, tooth to restore, I could, um, you know, obviously I've temporarily popped a composite on there, but I could plan for an indirect restoration that, you know, my, my doctors will do once the patient's stabilized. So this um, utilization of digital just means the patient's consented really well. She understands what's going on. She knows what what the reason is for doing these things. It's not just me as a clinician going, whoops, I slipped, you know, <laughs> something, a bit of tooth is broken off. Um, so it's really good. And it also means that once the patient is stable and we've, you can see the difference between her occlusion here. So we've made it much more even and much less um, sort of focused just on the molars there. And could we've saved- Could you do me a favor? I think yeah. when sometimes when people look at that bite and all the different colors, could you give us like a quick Coles notes on what it is that that looks like? Cause I think that sometimes like I work in offices and, and sometimes you're like, I don't know how to talk about this. Could you just give us like a quick Coles notes of, of what you would say to a patient or how you'd explain this? Sure. Well, obviously as a dental hygienist and therapist, we are not um, allowed to diagnose. Well, we're not in the UK allowed to diagnose that there are, um, occlusion or, or we can't give them splints to fix their occlusion issues but we are allowed to point out what it is that you know could be causing problems so for me for instance on this I, I can see that the occlusion isn't hugely even if we look at the first picture on the left hand side we've got a lot of red so the red spots are the areas where really it's very heavy when she's biting together it's extremely heavy and then we've got premolars there that are hardly being touched at all so they may just graze the premolars. And I'll go back to the initial photos as well in a bit, and you can see that the premolars aren't even in occlusion. And so there's a lot, a lot of pressure going on to these molars, which in an ordinary circumstance where you have a similar level of occlusion on all teeth, so if you were all blue on all of the teeth, you wouldn't be so concerned. But if you've got lots of patches of just red on just one or two teeth, you're starting to think, is there wear, is there going to be wear on these teeth or are we going to have fractures on the te these teeth? So the one that had broken that, that lower first molar, um, there was obviously a, a more red area there before it broke. And then we can see on the first molar on the lower right hand side, there's two red patches um, on the two distal cusps. And those are the two cusps that fractured off. So actually when we looked closer, there were um, micro fractures around the enamel um, that were real telltale signs that th those were going to fracture off. They were actually already fractured. They just hadn't had the 
she hadn't chomped down on the hard nut or the olive pip or <laughs> or any of those things that you know bread <laughs> that usually makes these these cusps go so so yeah if you're getting even blue all over or even green all over then you're you're kind of okay but when you start moving into yellow and red zones these areas are ones to watch for wear fractures and these are the teeth that I would then be transilluminating and looking a little closer to see if we've got some further concerns and I tend to also turn this into grayscale so you know on scanners you can have color but you can also have grayscale and when you put it onto grayscale you can tend to see wear a lot better um, and also with the itero um, scanner you can compare two scans so we take one scan one year one scan the next overlay the two sets of data and we can see to the micron if there's been a change so constantly monitoring and also encouraging the patient to come back for that monitoring scan to see if there's been changes so anyone who says oh i don't think that i am grinding my teeth actually and i don't think i need your help and i don't agree with your treatment plan you can say oh, no that's absolutely fine you know don't you don't need to worry about what i'm saying right now you can trust the science when you come back for your next scan and then you've got them the second time around <laughs> Thank you so much. I didn't mean to stop what you were going to say. I just, I know that there's a lot of questions in that part. So thank you. Yeah, it's, um, it's actually, you know, it's such a huge topic. The, uh, every single part of the scanner, the each, each element that you can do is, it's so fun. Um, what I like to do once I've got the patient stabilized is then communicate with them, but also to the doctor, what the patient would like. And this stops us miscommunicating. You know, if I say she wants two ones done and the doctor thinks she wants the two one done. Um, <laughs> so it just helps not, you know, ruin our communication and also keep the patient in the loop with what the plan is next. So I always re-snapshot this new um, stabilized dentition. You know, her gingery is much healthier. She's got no um, calculus built up again. She's We've removed all those old restorations. We've sorted the caries um and then i can send it to the dentist and this is what i mean by um this shared care um or collaborative care and it's something that i know in canada happens a lot more than happens in the uk and actually it's something that we're aspiring to changing um and it's also you know for me the way i promote that is by saying we can collaborate because we can we can speak better now because we have digital. We don't have only analog. We are able to use photography. We're able to use scans. Um, and so that's why a lot of my training focuses around digital because I feel that it removes the fear factor from our dentists and, um, that we might say something wrong or communicate incorrectly or not be as good as, as they are at treatment planning. Um, these are all the, the little, little tiny fears that the dentists tend to have. Um, but that, you know, that's why I'm focusing on that because I just feel that it's really making us able to progress in, um, in our, our profession. And I know that clinically Lauren does a lot of that progression sort of as, as the, in the clinical work she does, you know, working, um, as the head of the, the, um, therapists, um, in, in her group. So, um, I do it outside of the surgery. <laughs> I think Lauren does a lot of it in the surgery. <laughs> Well, Lauren, why don't you tell us what your specialty is, how you're managing this, because you have you have created and worked on some really unique skills and congratulations on those awards. Those awards are huge and you, you know, it's nice to see um, you being recognized and also you taking the time to share with us some of your knowledge. So what what would you like to share with with the listeners today? Well, thank you, Kerry. And um, so, yeah, like Kat said before, our paths are, and I think Nina as well, we're all similar but slightly different so um i think like cat i graduated 15 nearly 16 years ago so you know obviously like nina we started when we were five um, awesome. <laughs> but um when we came out you know we were very much trained to do this combined role of being um the dental therapist who also did the scope of a dental hygienist and um, i think when we came out um i ended up working in a few different practices and um, i think i just kind of thought like this is not the dream that i've been sold you know this is not what we were we were told it was going to be like and um, you know very much a lot of um um, especially back then, still quite commonly now, um, dental therapists will be working under the scope of um, a dental hygienist. They're maybe not using all their skills that they've been trained um, to perform. So, you know, I was doing, you know, sometimes in the UK as well, it can be 
you know, there are some practices, I think Nina and Kat, you've both done it as well, where, you know, appointments can be really, really short and um, because of the pressures of you know, finances and our National Health Service and whatnot. So sometimes appointments can be even like 15 minutes long, really, really short, um, 15, 20 minute appointments for um, dental hygiene. I have anxiety hearing 15 minutes. Yeah. <gasps> Oh my gosh, how am I, well, I think we all have survive? flashbacks. <laughs> how am so I going to show up the next day? Not sure. 15 minutes is a challenge, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, we train to do all these things in university, then we come out and that's what we're confronted with. So um, I then started working in the practice that I still work in um, 12 years ago. Um, our principal dentist had um, done a lot of training in the States. And she had come across this kind of combined model, like Kat was speaking about, like you guys do, where, you know, the, the um, dental hygienist or the dental therapist will um, do the examination on the patient, you know, maybe take the radiographs, assess, and then the dentist will pop through into the room to do to do their bit. Um, and that, that model really, um, I just thought was perfect. I just loved working like that. I don't think I could work in a different way anymore. Um, I think my passion is just really trying to spread the word on that and trying to allow dental therapists to work um, to their, their full capabilities, really. Because um, I just saw how much more it made me feel you know, satisfied in what I was doing, how much more I enjoyed my work day to day. And um, so now I work, um, as Beth kindly mentioned at the start, I work with a group of dental practices, um, mostly in Scotland, who um, we've now got about 20 dental therapists um, and we're, we have introduced dental therapy to all the practices, um, which means that the I think in the UK there there can be, as Kat said, like lack of awareness about what a dental therapist can do. And even when sometimes um, dentists can be aware of what we can do, it is a little bit scary for them because traditionally it has always been, you know, patient comes in, dentist assesses, dentist um, does all the treatment themselves, maybe passes off the periodontal treatment to the hygienist or the therapist. Um, but what we are finding is that actually passing some of the restorative work, so the direct restorations to the dental therapist actually allows the dentist to explore their passions more. So if they want to be placing implants, if they want to be doing smile makeovers, you know, whatever it is that they want to be doing, if they want to do endodontics, you know, whatever it is, um, once they kind of let go of that fear and start passing things over, it, it changes their working day as well for the better. You know, they can, if rather than have their kind of diaries, their day book full of, you know, short little appointments, they can book like a three hour appointment to do a smile design prep or, you know, whatever it is they want to do. So um, I think my passion is just kind of spreading the word on that and trying to make that more common in the UK because it, um, it really does work for the best for everyone. I, I have, I've had an opportunity to work with a like an office that has a restorative hygienist, so has these additional capabilities, and I have seen it work so well in so many different settings, and it's a matter of building trust, and that's the whole thing. The, the doctor has, the dentist has to trust that you're not going to all send up and take half the practice with them, because technically that could happen. Um, but I have found that this collaboration in any way, shape or form, or if it's not you working in there, having a good dentist that you feel trust and that you can collaborate with is the key to really helping people get healthy and access the care that they need. That's really where we're trying to go with this for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, that's always the aim is actually doing what's best for the patient, you know, so we, a lot of us, I think will do combined, um, you know, if, if the patient maybe needs periodontal treatment and they need some restorative care that we can offer, we're doing combined appointments and the patient is, you know, more time effective for them. They're seeing the person who's best suited to their needs and then they can go off and see the dentist and um, to have, you know, any treatment that's not within our scope of practice. And so it works, it works great for everyone. And what you were saying too about allowing the dentist to explore his or her passions. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a really great thing for us here if you're considering maybe pursuing restorative but you would like to do it in your dental office you're currently working at but right now there is no restorative that's a good conversation starter with the dentist that you're working with right if i pursue restorative if i go to this program and come back and work as a restorative here that's going to allow you as the practice owner to explore your passions so i love i picked up on what you just said there i think that that would be really applicable I got a little bit of a sneak peek into some of the cases you're working on. Is there anything that you'd be willing to share with our listeners as far as what you've got, yeah, what sure, you're working absolutely. on? Um, so well, let me just get my, uh, 
Okay, oh, let me just share my screen. Can you all see that? All good. Yeah. yeah. So this is just, I work for a group called Pain Free Dentistry Group. So this is our little thing. Um, we treat all our patients holistically and we hope that they're all happy. So we take little pictures with them just saying pain-free pain dentistry. Um, and that is, I say that's kind of our, our unique selling point. Um, I just did a little showcase really of the different things that we can do as a dental therapist, you know, and how we combine care. So um, these are just some periodontal cases that I have worked on and some are um, kind of more um, active periodontal treatment um, some are more kind of stain removal and whatnot, but this these would all be um kind of within the scope of the hygienist. Um, and then I know Kath, you had um mentioned, you know, showcasing a bit of what we do with prevention in the UK. So this is actually a patient that I saw, and um, this is probably like the best transformation that I have ever seen. So um she was a lady who was 45 years old, she hadn't been to the dentist in a long, long time, extreme dental fear, really, really nervous coming into the practice and I'm sure you guys will all know you know that those are sometimes the most satisfying patients to treat um although it's it can be difficult and when they actually come in and they then enjoy coming to see you it makes such a difference and um, so she had basically just stopped brushing her teeth because she just felt that they were beyond help she didn't feel that you know she could do anything to save them so she just really given up on it completely and um, you can see she had some retained deciduous teeth and um, as well as um periodontally affected um permanent teeth as well um, and we gave her really just a kind of simple home care routine to begin with just got her to get herself an electric toothbrush and um, just gave her some simple brushing advice um, and just really took things at her pace to see where we got to. Um, it was given a soft tooth, soft manual toothbrush to start with even. Um, it showed her with a hand mirror and what to do. Um, when we started to get the inflammation levels down, we introduced the electric toothbrush um, and then interdental brushes eventually. But unfortunately, her um, so her upper kind of retained deciduous teeth and her upper central teeth um, were beyond saving, unfortunately. So they were extracted um, and she then had this um, denture that you can see in the bottom photograph. But her lower teeth, basically all that transformation was just through periodontal treatment and her amazing home care, which she she still is, you know, coming in and her gums still look like that. And she's doing a great job. So the idea is that she is now stable um, and she will eventually go on to hopefully have some dental implants when her finances allow. And so it just shows what we as um, hygienists or therapists can do, you know, to help our to help our patients. And then the next slide was just um, some restorative care. So restorative and aesthetic treatment. So as dental therapists, we can treat for um, dental caries, dental decay, or um, you know aesthetic treatment as long as they're direct restoration. So those are just a few of the different cases um, that I've done kind of fairly recently. Um, and there's always, so there's always challenges and whatnot, but I really, I really enjoy doing restorative work as well. Um, and I think it's, it's quite satisfying for the patients when it's um, something they can see. I don't know if um, in Canada, do you still, do you still use um, amalgam restorations? Do you use those at all? Silver ones? Not as often. It, like, I think there's always like that, that case, but for the most part, amalgam is not utilized as readily or as often in, I would mm -hmm. say most cases, the same sort of thing. Um, absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's in the UK, it's still fairly common. Um, but we do, you know, we we'll see a lot of patients, um, Nina and Kat will probably agree that, you know, come in wanting to have their amalgam restorations replaced. So um, we do a lot of that as well and those cats just showing you a great case where that was um the case as well so yeah amazing so yeah. i know we're oh sorry go ahead. oh sorry did you want to ask something about the picture sorry <laughs> i was like jumping the gun <laughs> there we go <laughs> can you see Were you no i wasn't i just oh, said i just said beautiful work oh oh thank you <laughs> Thank you. So, Sorry, I Carrie. I thought you were going to say something. <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. I know I talk a lot. I hope that that's okay. I like to interject and I'm like, I've got all these mind things that are running through like my head. The but... are bunny. We love it. I know. I know exactly. So one, one thing to the other, always the way it goes. So we only have a few minutes left, but if you had like a crystal ball, what do you think, or where do you think the future of dentistry lies maybe in the UK or in general, or what, like maybe there's an area you would love to see improved, like just in maybe a short little section. Cause we go through all three of you. So. Who wants to go first? I'm going to pick on Nina. Nina, you go first. What would your crystal ball be? 
Well, I think there's a huge, huge thing for holistic care coming up. I'm, I'm getting more people message me all the time about what course can I do for nutrition? And they've got this, you know, with the myofunctional therapy, the breathing, um, we've got people doing sort of functional testing now as well. And there are, there is more sort of research emerging all the time. So I think watch that space um, with the holistic sort of side of it as well. Awesome. Lauren, you're up next. Um, I just hope that um, dental therapists will be more utilised, more readily utilised in the UK. Um, and along the lines of what Nina's saying, you know, holistic care, because traditionally we have had these kind of set appointment times, you know, where it's just been, you know, we'll not mention the 15 minute appointments, but maybe 30 minute appointments carry slightly better. And where it's just been one after the other after the other and not actually tailoring the care potentially to you know, the length of time that the patient might need. So and um, we are moving more towards that, but I would like to see more of that as well. I'm really glad you brought that up because I think that that is something that is consistent in every country. Anyone that I talk to that's in dentistry, it's like we get stuck in, well, I only have 60 minutes or I'm only, I'm only allowed to book 30. We have to have the opportunity and we also have to be able to express the reasons that we need these things. And to know that just because it's always been 40 minutes or 50 minutes doesn't mean that that's exactly what that, that patient needs. So I think that that's, that's huge. Kat, what do you have to add to this? What would your crystal ball look like or area of, of, of growth be? Um, I think for myself, um, what I would really like to see is more parity between the the different professions within dentistry. So we have a lot of overlap with what a dental um, hygienist can do, overlaps what a dental therapist can do, overlaps what a dentist can do, and so on and so forth. And I feel that at the moment in the UK, there's a huge drive for people to use dental therapists, thanks to, you know, a lot, a lot in a lot of parts, thanks to what mm -hmm. Lauren speaking about for the last and, and Nina for the last few years um but there is a slight concern that people think that the reason they're using a therapist is because we are cheaper um ah. and not recognizing what Lauren was saying which is that actually it's not that we're cheaper it's that we free up time for the dentist to earn more um so for me it's about parity so you know if I do a restoration it's worth the same as if the dentist does a restoration if I do if the dentist does periodontal treatment it should be worth the same as the periodontal treatment that the hygienist does you know um and so for me it's just about recognizing each individual for their talents and allowing them to really um, excel in that regardless of what their, reg their um, registration says or their qualification says well, I know we could talk for hours and I'm like, okay, there's so many things in each what you said. I'm like, okay, we need to like seriously each have our own little coffee chat because it's my first time I've met you guys. Kath and Beth have talked so highly of you. I'm really excited that we got to meet. Um, you know, it really is an honor to have you guys on here. I'm so excited you're going to be on the DHQ coming forward. Um, we've had some great questions. We've been able to answer them best we can, but the show has to end. We have to let people get back to work. We've spent lunch hour with most people or dinner, as we found out. Kath, do you have anything or would you like to share what's coming up at RDHU in the I next little will. while? Yes. Awesome. I, I just did a little movie. Um, you let me know if you can see it okay. Oh, hang on one thing. We're, you want to just um, put on presenter mode or swap displays. Oh, there you go. That's right. Thank you.
for that all day. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. We've got some great uh, courses that are coming up with RDHU. And if you are not subscribing or do not join the uh, DHQ, reach out to RDHU at info at RDHU, and they will give you information on it. Um, Kat and uh, Nina, Lauren, uh, Nina, Lauren, and Kat, man, I don't know why that was hard for me. Um, if people want to get hold of you, can you just say how they can kind of reach out to you? And then we will say a big thank you from everybody. And, uh, and I will also, I will also include all that information and your emails or whatever you want to give in the follow-up email. So we'll send that out Monday or Tuesday. Let's see. Okay. How do we get hold of you, Kat? Oh, um, so Instagram is always a good one. I'm cat underscore London therapist, um, or my website, um, www.themoderntherapist.co.uk. Awesome. Lauren, how do we get hold of you? Um, Instagram as well. Um, mine is Lauren at Cherry Bank, which is the practice where I work. I'm sure Kathleen will send it out anyway. Um, and I'll, I'll tag you guys in anything we post. Um, and yeah, I'll send up my email as well. Happy for anyone to contact if they've got any queries. And Nina, what about yourself? Yeah, Instagram is always good. So I'm Nina.integratedhealth and um yeah, Nina.integratedhealth.co.uk uh, for my email address as well. Wonderful. Well, you ladies have all taught me some some really awesome things. It's nice to see that, you know, even though we're countries apart, we are still very much aligned in some of the common uh, roadblocks we have here, you have there, which doesn't make it better, but at least it makes us not feel like we're on a desert island by ourselves. So, you know, we are all on the same section. Beth, do you have anything else to add? I know I've totally taken over the end of the show here. <laughs> No, it's good. I'm just, I'm just, I'm not, I'm in my happy place. When we said goodbye at the airport, I, I was <laughs> tearing up and I kind of feel it coming again. We just, honestly, we just need more of you, you three in our lives. So we'll definitely have you back in any capacity we can get you back in. So just from the bottom of my heart, thank you for being here and sharing your insights and your knowledge with all of us. Thank, thank you. you all. So thank you. All right. Have a great Bye, weekend, everybody. everybody. We'll see you in March, okay? <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you.